So we'll move on now to the presentation of the Cobra Medal. Uh, the medal will be presented by Dr. David Ginsberg, who is a professor of uh, internal medicine, um, pediatrics, genetics, uh, HHMI investigator, a member of the NAS and the IOM. Well, thanks very much. There's something very special about having the uh, Cobra Medal recipient this year be a former student of the Cobra Lecture, and not only the recipient of the Cobra Medal, but his daughter, Margaret, who's here, uh, also uh, trained under Dr. Sparling at uh, UNC. And I think that's very cool, actually. And again, congratulations to Dr. Sparling. Well, where do I do the slides? Well, here's a list of uh, previous uh, Cobra Medal recipients. This is a wonderful tradition. Uh, there are many of the giants of academic medicine here. Now, Francis's name certainly belongs on this historic list, and it's my privilege to tell you why. Uh, Francis has had a remarkable career, has done so many things and made so many historic contributions to science and medicine that it's going to be very difficult for me to summarize all this in this short three-hour talk. Um, but I'll do my best. I'm going to start out with my acknowledgments. Uh, first, I want to thank Francis uh, for being such a great friend and for giving me this great honor of presenting the Cobra Medal to him. Uh, I also want to acknowledge his daughters, Liz and Margaret, who are at the bottom picture there and sitting in the front row, uh, um, who are here for their dad and part of our extended family. And uh, I have to give a particular thanks to Diane in the upper right. Uh, Francis's wife, who is my primary co-conspirator in this presentation and the source of all the good stories and pictures without whom none of this would be possible. So I'm going to start out with an outline of my talk. And here's what I hope to cover uh, in these next uh, three hours. Well, I'll be shorter than that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about where Francis came from, his training and background, what he's discovered, how he ended up at the NIH, what he's been doing there over the past six years, and then finally, how and why his family and friends put up with all this. And then the last thing will be an opportunity for Francis to provide a rebuttal. And I'm already starting to dread that because, well, I'll start off with an anecdote. I, Francis and I used to teach a genetics course together through medical students at Michigan. Actually, after he went to the NIH, he would come back to give a genome lecture. And he did something that was incredibly unfair. We would give lectures, and I, you know, I worked pretty hard at this. I thought I did a pretty good job. And then Francis would give his lecture, and he would always end by playing the guitar and singing a song about being a medical student to the tune of Frank Sinatra's My Way. The students would go berserk, and by the end, there was a standing ovation. And the scores for the rest of us for teaching, I mean, it, wasn't, it really was not fair competition. <laughs> and I have, to, I, I have a feeling that the exact same thing is going to happen to me again today. So, uh, you know, Francis and I are both geneticists, and, you know, all geneticists know that any good story has to start out with a family history. Uh, so here's a four-generation pedigree. Uh, Francis is the proband who's indicated by the arrow here. Uh, Francis's parents, Margaret and Fletcher, uh, met at graduate school at Yale. Um, uh, his mother was a graduate student in, uh, in English and his father in drama. They finally s settled in Stanton, Virginia in 1946, where Fletcher taught theater at Mary Baldwin College and Margaret wrote plays. They spent the rest of their very full lives in Stanton, both living to the age of 98, married for 73 years. Uh, they served as a center of music and theater culture in Stanton, including their annual Twelfth Night Music uh, a party that, which is attended by major folk music uh, figures each year and to which Francis would, would uh, uh, reliably go every year and participate as well. Uh, Francis was born in 1950. He's the youngest of four brothers. Uh, here he is with his uh, family uh, playing music, which will be a recurring theme here, I think, all the way through this entire, our joint presentation. Uh, this is in their home, Penny Royal Farm, where they initially lived. Uh, br and his uh, brothers. Uh, and in the front, you can see uh, uh, Kit and then Francis on the right there. Um, 
Here they are in more recent times, the four brothers, and again, Francis is the youngest. Some of you may recognize him over on the left and see a little bit of family resemblance. Well, France, this is Francis at age two, already sort of interested in math and numbers, playing cards with his grandmother. Uh, here he is at age nine on the farm, uh, where he was homeschooled until he was 10. He then attended Robert E. Lee High School. That's his graduation picture at age 16. He then went on to the University of Virginia, where he graduated in 1970, and this is him with his college band. Uh, and Diane tells me that this is the last picture that anyone has of Francis without a mustache. So I, looking through his CV, I dug out what I think is his first, first author paper. I have to tell you, I have absolutely no idea what this is about. Um, but it does seem kind of complicated. Uh, I'm not even going to try to tell you anything about the work from his PhD. Uh, Francis got his PhD in physical chemistry at Yale in 1974. Um, unlike me, I, I quickly figured out that I wasn't smart enough to be a mathematician or a physicist. Francis actually was smart enough and got his PhD in physical chemistry. But after his PhD and some soul searching, ultimately decided to switch to medicine. I went to the University of North Carolina for his uh, uh, MD, internship residency, chief residency year, which we all already heard a bit from Dr. Sparling, and then finally off to Yale as a genetics fellow uh, from 81 through 84. Uh, and this is his first paper uh, from his fellow, two, two major, uh, well, three major papers, which I'm gonna tell you about from his postdoctoral work. Uh, and he actually made what were really important findings in the hemoglobin world. He worked out the, the molecular basis of uh, what's called hereditary, uh, non-deletion forms of hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, mutations in the, in the globin genes, and I'm not gonna go through a lot of the details, but it was good old-fashioned genetics, not old-fashioned at the time. Uh, and then perhaps his biggest innovation that, that launched the, the next phase of his career was an idea that uh, he worked out with Sherm Weissman uh, at Yale uh, that he re they referred to as uh, chromosome jumping. And in, the, in those days, this is long before our current technology, uh, figuring out how to get to one place uh, in the genome to the next place, we used to do something called walking, one clone leading to the next clone leading to the next clone. And Francis came up with this very clever idea of making these large circles that would put pieces together that were quite a distance apart. And now instead of walking little bit by little bit, you would jump over big distances. And this turned out to be quite an innovative and clever idea. And, uh, and one that he built on later, as I'll tell you in a few minutes. Well, Francis moved to Michigan in 1984. He was there till 93. For some reason, I have a particular fondness for this phase of his career. Um, I, I first met Francis when I came to interview. Uh, I came to Michigan one year later in 85, and we became very good friends. I don't know if you remember this, Francis. This is our, the Genetics Gordon Conference we went to together just before I started on the faculty in 85. That's us. Uh, you may notice some other members of our society in this picture who had big influences, like Joe Goldstein in the corner here on, on both of us. Um, and we were part of a group of uh, young faculty at Michigan coincident with uh, the early days of the Howard Hughes at Michigan, most of us recruited by Bill Kelly, a former uh, Cobra Medal winner, and uh, all very beholden to Bill for uh, the profound influence he had on all our careers. And you may recognize some of these people, actually two of whom, in addition to Francis, uh, have been featured at this meeting, Jeff Lydon in the top middle and Craig Thompson in the lower right. They all look a few years younger than they are now, but not that much. Uh, this is a picture from uh, not that many years ago when Bill Kelly won this very same Cobra medal. You can see Bill there surrounded by a bunch of his uh, um, uh, former recruits uh, to Michigan, uh, including uh, Betsy Nabel, uh, who uh, won the Cobra medal last year. Well, Francis uh, uh, labored in the lab for his first few years at Michigan. It was a very tough problem working on using this jumping technique and, and other methods uh, uh, to, to find a gene by purely genetic means, uh, the gene for cystic fibrosis we've already heard about. We actually even saw the picture of this very same classic uh, issue of science. 
Uh, and this was where the cloning of the cystic fibrosis gene was, was reported. And this was a, a close collaboration between several groups, Lap Chi Choi uh, um, and, uh, and at, in Toronto and Francis at Michigan, and these were the papers. Uh, and this was a, a landmark achievement, identifying this very important human disease gene purely by genetic means, uh, a term that uh, Francis was one of the major uh, people to co coin the term positional cloning. Um, this is his lab on the left around 1989, uh, and uh, Francis's illustration that got a lot of press coverage at the time of, of what, what positional cloning is like finding the proverbial needle in the haystack. Uh, he got a lot of mileage out of that one. This, this method uh, turned out to be quite useful in using that and related techniques. Uh, Francis had a number of other uh, major findings, and these were extremely exciting uh, days. The idea that we could find disease genes with no information about the gene at all, other than that it was a genetic disease, was, was astounding, but it really worked. Uh, this ne next big success was uh, neurofibromatosis type 1, a classic autosomal dominant disease. Um, Francis was part of a large collaborative team, his lab and a number of others that found the Huntington's disease uh, uh, gene on the tip of chromosome 4. And these were incredible, exciting, triumphant days. And now here was this gene that we previously knew nothing about, and now we had this new opportunity to study the biology. And, and it's so satisfying that at this very same meeting, in the case of cystic fibrosis, we've seen this come full circle where finally, after 30 years, we actually are start, have treatments based on our understanding of that gene and, and how it all works. Uh, Francis's lab and, and his work uh, contributed to identification of all, a number of other Mendelian uh, uh, disease genes, as listed here. Uh, and then in 1993, a great tragedy struck us at Michigan. Uh, Francis decided to move to the NIH. And we all asked ourselves at the time, why would you move to the NIH? One idea we had was perhaps it was the great pay. Um, but it's actually, well, the lack of bureaucracy. You know, I mean, the government runs so seamlessly and smoothly, and that was a great attraction to Francis. Freedom from regulation. You know, nothing at the NIH is regulated at all. And the generous entertainment budget they have. For any of you who have ever visited Francis as part of a committee or whatever, the, you, they actually can't buy you coffee on NIH money. You know, Francis has to bring that himself. Or you, it, it turns out to be quite charming because you get to go to dinner at Francis and Diane's house where they whip something up because there's, you're actually not allowed to entertain on government money. Those weren't the reasons why I went. The reason was the genome. Uh, Bernadine Healy re uh, recruited Francis to become the, the second director of the Genome Project and to the first director of the uh, NHGRI, the Genome Institute at the NIH. And this had a real appeal for him. Uh, this was a new kind of science, uh, the Genome Project, that we'd never really seen before in biology. This was a huge collaborative, more like physicists do, where you had many, many people working together and, and, and participating. And this is just a small group of those people at a gathering. But Francis was really the face of this project, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the voice of, of uh, the Genome Project. And, a, a really major intellectual force in guiding the way this whole thing went. Uh, sort of, I guess, for political reasons, we declared success at a specific day in 2001. Of course, completing the genome really wasn't, it's not like they read the last base that day. It was a pretty arbitrary decision, and there's still some holes that are being filled in. But that's the official date that the finish line is said to have been crossed, uh, and uh, quite a, a uh, uh, a lot of fanfare and a lot of public interest in this event. Um, Craig Ventner, some of you may have known, was, was heading a commercial project. And it's actually kind of amusing to reflect now on that's barely a blip in history anymore. Uh, Francis was a steadfast defender of the idea that this all had to be part of the public domain. And of course, the human genome is completely freely available public information to all uh, scientists and everyone else for that matter. And I think Francis gets a lot of the credit uh, for that. Uh, I, I like, things have changed quite a bit since then. I like this slide, Francis, seen this before. Eric Green took over from Francis as head of the Genome Institute. And Eric likes to point out the way things have changed from 2000 when Francis was the director of NHGRI. 
And if you asked then how many human genomes could you sequence for $10 million, was Francis was at the NHGRI, and Eric calculated about a half of a genome. And if you compare that, what you can do now under Eric's regime, uh, it's somewhere around 10,000. So things have changed dramatically uh, in that period of time. So if you look at the impact this has had on human genetics, it really is truly astounding. Uh, and it, it's really miraculous to think about. Uh, back when many of us, including me and Francis, when we were medical students, there was one human disease for which we knew the responsible gene. That was the hemoglobinopathies, thalassemias and sickle cell. By the time Fan Francis and his team found the, the cystic fibrosis gene in 1989, we still had only a few, a handful of human diseases for which we knew the, knew the gene. This slide's outdated. I haven't been able to find a more recent one. It's now up around 3,000 or so, 6,000, sorry, I was just off by a factor of two. Um, 6,000 human diseases for which we know the responsible gene. I mean, it's a truly astounding uh, uh, accomplishment and, and miraculous progress in the way we look at human diseases. Amazingly, despite doing all this stuff and playing this major role in national policy, Francis continued uh, and today continues to run a highly productive lab. I, I frankly don't know how he does it. Um, and this was one of, uh, it was another major uh, human disease cracked by Francis's lab and his collaborators. Uh, Hutchinson Guilford progeria, a very, and this is a different kind of genetics. This is by and large sporadic new mutations, a much harder problem. You couldn't do this in the old fashioned positional cloning way. And this was enabled by the genome, like all 6,000 of those other uh, diseases for which we now know the gene. Uh, and, and, and really a very exciting and, and much follow up work on this from Francis's lab. Uh, his lab has also been interested in complex diseases, most notably type 2 diabetes collaborative work with Mike Benke and others. This is also another one of those things like the genome, enormously collaborative, many groups working together. And as you can see, we now know many genes that account for a very small fraction of the heritability of diabetes, but some, and have taught us a lot about uh, how this disease works. Uh, but Francis has done other things, um, many other projects, large scale biology like the genome, the HapMap project, ENCODE, Francis has played a major role in, in uh, looking at ethical, legal, and social issues. Uh, these pictures are from the sort of policy work around uh, GINA, the Genetics Non-Discrimination Act, enormously important for the practice of clinical genetics, which Francis played a major role in, in advocating and being a spokesman for. So uh, in 2009, Francis had another decision to say to make is uh, should he stay at the NIH, and many of the same reasons applied. Uh, there were other things about the NIH, you get to wear goofy clothes like this, you know, when you're showing people around the NIH. But the real reason was that he was uh, picked by uh, uh, President Obama to be the new NIH director, and Francis uh, uh, decided to take that on. Uh, unlike most of us, Francis is very open in public about his thoughts and feelings on the big, and some of us would say unknowable, questions. Even though Francis and I come from very different traditions and religious views, I've always had tremendous respect for his integrity, bravery, and openness in talking about his faith. I was surprised, and I have to say a little offended, by the view expressed by some scientists that religious belief should disqualify someone as NIH director. Francis weathered this undemocratic criticism with incredible grace and integrity that I'll always uh, greatly admire. He's written uh, books, uh, 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 several books dealing with issues of reconciling faith and science which have been inspirational to many. The fourth book at the end actually has nothing at all to do with religion. It's another bestseller of his uh, that's about precision medicine. But I just put it up there because I didn't know where else to put it, you know, that's the books. Um, so what else does an NIH director do? Uh, testifies to Congress. Um, uh, this was uh, involved in uh, uh, advocating for the GINA legislation, uh, entertaining distinguished visitors to the NIH and trying to interest and get them excited about science, uh, announcing, uh, 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 consulting with, uh, um, with the president about various initiatives, uh, uh, the brain initiative, others. 
Uh, Francis has really been the physician scientist in chief uh, for, for all of us. I think it's a, a, a debt we all owe him a tremendous uh, uh, debt of gratitude and, and thanks for uh, advocating for not just for uh, research funding, but for all aspects of uh, what we of, bio, of the importance of biomedical research, uh, the very core values of our society. I don't think anyone could have better carried out this role, uh, particularly at these very difficult uh, times. Though this job requires considerable uh, uh, personal sacrifice, you also get to meet a lot of famous people. Um, and, and Francis always gets a kick out of that. Uh, he, he may hold a record for the scientists with the most uh, uh, appearances on The Colbert Show. And unquestionably, in the final episode, my son pointed out that he, he was convinced that Francis was the only one who actually knew all the words in that piece. Um, uh, and, you know, lots of famous people have somehow managed to make their way through the NIH. Uh, but there are other things you have to do, dealing with the budget, uh, promoting various initiatives, and there's complicated and, and multi-sides to all of these, dealing with our constituency as well as the public. Uh, that takes quite a lot of his time. So let me just quickly run through a, a very rapid summary of the rest of his CV, uh, which is, uh, there's a bit of substance to, but he's got, his honors are too numerous to count. There are very many of them listed there. Uh, somehow, in the midst of all the stuff he does, he's found time to write a couple of papers. Um, amazingly, high percentage of them is first or senior author, actually. Uh, so, does he do anything else other than work? It's sort of a fundamental question you have to ask yourself. Um, well, he does. In the upper left, uh, this is a picture taken uh, when Francis was volunteering in Nigeria. He actually did one of those trips with his daughter, Margaret, when you were a medical student, right? I think, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, I guess you could classify that as a, a kind of work. Um, but he actually does really play. Uh, this is a vacation in the Zurich train station in the lower left, and Diane tells me it's the only time that she's ever seen Francis ask for directions. Um, <laughs> they've taken uh, lots of vacations in lots of exciting places. Uh, Francis is well known for his motorcycle, loves the image of that, but that's actually, a, he's been driving this for a long time. This isn't that he just sort of pulled out the motorcycle because it, you know, was good press. Uh, that's taking my daughter for a ride when she was about uh, eight or nine. Um, and uh, here he is, uh, that's actually on the right was his first day as NIH director, and he came out, there was a note on his motorcycle that said, are you having fun yet? Um, <laughs> France has become a bit of an exercise nut, and I guess that's not directly related to work. Uh, part of his uh, personal, oh, personal, personalized medicine initiative, he discovered that he has, we, I like to tease him a little about this, a, a modestly increased risk for diabetes from uh, uh, the SNP pattern and all, but it, it served as an incentive to get him to lose some weight and exercise, and, and he does everything with intensity, including that. Uh, he also, skis, and he's a bit of a daredevil. Um, maybe after I have a few more drinks, I could tell you about uh, uh, our uh, rollerblading escapades, our family's rollerblading, um, but it'll take a couple of drinks to get to that. Uh, music has been a, a huge part of, uh, of what Francis does, uh, and, and when he's uh, uh, not in the not working. Music is uh, one of the pl play ways he, he spends a lot of his uh, uh, time. Um, from his uh, college band to this is uh, one of the Twelfth Night events at his parents' home in Stanton, uh, playing with celebrities, uh, playing with uh, bands with his lab and others at the NIH, uh, music nights at, uh, at uh, Diane and Francis's uh, home. Uh, in uh, Bethesda. Uh, music has is, is been a big part of, of uh, what he does outside of the lab. So finally, why do his family and friends uh, put up with all this? Well, because somehow, with all the things he does, Francis still finds the time and makes it a top priority to be a wonderful husband, father, a grandfather, and friend. Uh, his wife, 
uh, and best friend Diane plays a central role in Francis's work in life and play. He's a great father to his daughters, Margaret and Liz, who are here today, and a doting grandfather to his five grandchildren. And I'll let these pictures speak for themselves. There's not enough time to identify everybody here, but Francis and Diane actually are trusted with the children on their own, which is quite a thing, uh, and, uh, and have had some lots of wonderful times together. I don't know if I can tell them about the time you lost the kids when they, the door was, oh, okay, I'll get into that after a couple of drinks. Um, and, and they do, do lots of really fun things together and lots of great family vacations. Uh, and they also get to share in some of the celebrations and, and notable professional moments, which I think is, is a lot of fun and, uh, and very special. Here's the whole family, actually. Uh, I think this is the Medal of Science uh, event, and with all the grandkids as well as uh, uh, Francis and Diane and, uh, and his uh, two daughters. Um, you know, as, a, as his friend, I have lots of very, very fond memories of the time we've spent uh, together. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful for all these memories and, and the shared family events over the 30 years that we've been uh, very close uh, uh, dear friends. Uh, with that, I want to thank the AAP uh, for selecting Francis for this well-deserved award and for giving me the privilege of presenting this year's Cobra Award recipient. Congratulations, Francis. It's now Francis's turn for a rebuttal after we take a picture. was pretty unbelievable. David, I can't tell you how grateful I am to you for the time and effort that went into that and for leaving out the things I was afraid you were going to really bring up. <laughs> you didn't mention the time that we played racquetball and sort of forgot that we were both supposed to be giving grand rounds at the University of Michigan Medical Center and got a call from Bill Kelly's secretary saying, where the hell are you? <laughs> As we were both uh, sweaty and about to jump into the shower, we decided just to pretend we hadn't gotten that call. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should, oh, Bill's here. Oh. <sighs> but no, we have indeed shared many things uh, since we landed at that wonderful uh, University of Michigan Medical Center now some 30 years ago. And to be friends and to have our families uh, enjoy being friends with each other, it's just been a wonderful part of a very rich and marvelous life experience. So thank you for being willing to take this on. And Diane, thank you for sharing just enough, not too much. Well, I always worry about how one says thank you for things that are so completely over the top, unexpected, and certainly I cannot, when I look at that list of all of those who have previously received this medal, imagine a more distinguished group of leaders of academic medicine over decades and decades. And it's very hard to say that I deserve to be on that list at all. I'm reminded, and maybe I'll paraphrase uh, Jack Benny, who when he received award said, well, I don't really deserve this award, but I have arthritis and I didn't deserve that either. <laughs> So I've actually got plantar fasciitis, but I didn't deserve that. <laughs> but anyway, it is such a joy to be here with all of you, looking out at this uh, gathering of people who have meant so much to me over these decades that I've had the privilege of being part of this remarkable community. And to see this next generation here that I had a chance to meet with yesterday in an APSA session and to see the energy and the the talent, the creativity, and the optimism, even in the face of what are admittedly somewhat challenging times, 
I am fully confident uh, that American medicine is on a wonderful path forward in terms of the medical research potential. And I want to thank the AAP, which I actually was about to become the president of when I was asked to become NIH director and uh, couldn't do both. So I'm forever grateful to the AAP Council for accommodating that and also glad that I didn't have to go to all the trouble of organizing one of these meetings because it's a lot of work. But thank you for those who did. And thinking about the history of the AAP uh, coming here for this gathering, I noted that, of course, one of the founders was none other than Sir William Osler. And no occasion of this sort is complete without some reference, I think, uh, to Osler. So I'll just mention my favorite way in which Osler described what we are all about in one single sentence, capturing our focus on basic science, on translation, on clinical research, on implementation and reaching out to help people who need it. So this is what he wrote. To wrest from nature the secrets which have perplexed philosophers in all ages, to trace to their sources the causes of disease, to correlate the vast stores of knowledge that they may be quickly available for the prevention and cure of disease. These are our ambitions. Doesn't that say it? For all of you who've been in this for a long time, I think you're resonating. If you're just coming into this, I hope you are resonating too. Well, I am not only grateful to David for having gone to the amount of labor it takes to put this together, but particularly grateful that my family could be here and already having had them recognized, my daughter Margaret, uh, who's a nephrologist in Wilmington, North Carolina, and my daughter Elizabeth, a social worker in Tecumseh, Michigan having left their children behind to come and be here for a wonderful weekend. And my wonderful wife, Diane, who, as you heard, is my right arm in everything that we do and who has made NIH not just an amazing institution but also a family place by the way in which she has become part of that leadership team in the most remarkable warm and giving way. So that, yes, because we can't serve you even anything beyond water on campus, if you come to our house, I'll make you a martini, and Diane will fix you some amazing hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> David also mentioned my desire to not only ask the questions about nature, but to ask questions that sometimes go outside of nature in terms of the why questions as well as the how. I just have to say that sitting next to my desk at my home, where I'm often sitting at 4.30 in the morning, bleary-eyed, trying to figure out what is going to be the plan for the day, I print and have printed out a brief Franciscan prayer, which has three parts of it that seem particularly appropriate uh, for this. So I just thought I'd read those to you. And it goes like this. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. I love the foolishness part. And in that note, I think we need a little bit more foolishness here before we all go off to receptions and dinner, and I'm just the guy to provide it. So one moment. <laughs> well, in thinking about what kind of music this occasion deserved, no, I'm not going to sing my way. You heard enough about that, and those poor medical students had to live through it. No, I thought this ought to be a song that kind of recognizes the community that we're all part of and the people that we're all grateful to, but particularly from my perspective, the people I'd like to say thank you to. So maybe that can be done in a musical way. Maybe you'll decide later it was a bad idea, but we're going to try it. And by the way, this is a group event. There is a chorus here. And you can't say it's too hard to learn, because it's not. This is actually a rendition of a uh, folk song that's often sung at the end of a folk festival, when everybody's feeling all mellow. And they get all the performers up on stage, and they sing, OK, let's sing one more song. 
and they sing this song about, this is a song for all the good people. Well, I'm going to sing about all the good people, but I want you to also. So I'll sing the chorus, and then I'll get into the verses. But when the chorus comes around, I hope you'll jump in too. Because the words are, this is a song for all the good people, all the good people who are part of this family. This is a song for all the good people. This is not hard. We're joined together by this common thread. That's the only hard part. We're joined together by this common thread. Okay. And it goes like this. This is a song for all the good people. All the good people who are part of this family. This is a song for all the good people. We're joined together by this common thread. Well, this is a song for all of my mentors. You've been at the center. You've taught me a ton for Kirkman. Parker, Weissman, and Kelly. You've helped me do lots more than I might have done. This is a song, come on y'all, for all the good people, all the good people who are part of this family. This is a song for all the good people. We're joined together by this common thread. Well, this is a song for my awesome family, for Diane who brings joy wherever she goes. I know I've been busy, dear Margaret and Lizzie, but you've blessed my life and it's your love that shows. This is a song for all the good people, all the good people, we're part of this family. This is a song for all the good people. We're joined together by this common thread. This is a song for all of my patients who came to me hoping some help could be found. Assumed good intentions of my interventions it's being your partner that makes this profound. This is a song for all the good people, all the good people who are part of this family. This is a song for all the good people. We're joined together by this common thread. Now a verse for maybe all of us here. Well, this is a song for all us researchers who study the causes, whose dreams are quite real. When all of this learning and all this discerning can answer the yearning and help us to heal. This is a song for all the good people all the good people who are part of this family. This is a song for all the good people. We're joined together by this common thread. This song's almost over, and I thank you for Cobra, a day to remember. A feeling so strong, my cred has been saved by my best friend David. So just one more time now, let's lift up this song. Stand up now, come on. So this is a song for all the good people, all the good people who are part of this family. This is a song for all the good people. Oh, we're joined to 